All right, my name's Tim. Uh, this is a double shot of Magicraft, because I'm also <laughs> with Magicraft. Um, it's me on Twitter, it's me on GitHub. Uh, in Magicraft, we teach kids how to code in Minecraft through the metaphor of magic. Uh, our stack at the moment, among other things, is uh, Minecraft, GraphQL, Apollo, and React. This is for our, our client application, our in-browser IDE, which you create all your Magicraft code, which then gets uh, <coughs> piped into Minecraft, so you can actually run those spells or those codes inside Minecraft. Uh, this, is our, this is the current state of the um, client. I'm working on it uh, every day at the moment, trying to get ready for NDC, Oslo, and um, uh, Code Dojo School's projects in Ireland. Uh, see what I can do. Show you quickly. This is the actual thing. Uh, it's plus. Uh, so yeah, you can you get the code examples uh, on the side, which you discover in Minecraft. Actually, I can show you my cool tour. This is, I'm still building this, but uh, this is kind of an onboarding thing. It's using a uh, React Joyride, which is a cool little tour module. Uh, yeah. Just to keep that one. Oh, it's not working right now. Um, yeah, that's our client. Today, though, I'm going to be talking about the back end. A few, a few months ago now. We decided uh, let's redevelop our backend, use uh, GraphQL because it's uh, quite nice. Uh, GraphQL uh, was originally developed by Facebook internally in 2012, and it was only publicly released in uh, 2015, so it's relatively new. Uh, you'll be hearing a lot about it as um, time goes on. I've already given two talks on it. Matt Wade, who gave a talk earlier, uh, he gave a talk on it at the last local host. Yeah, there's a lot of people starting to use it and enjoy it and talk about it. Uh, some of the benefits of using uh, GraphQL is it gives you a single endpoint. As a bit of context, GraphQL is kind of a replacement for REST. So you build an API in it, um, and then it provides you like a, a structured uh, typing system, uh, a really nice way to query it. And uh, it's kind of decouples your backend from your actual API definition, uh, which is pretty nice. Uh, it becomes the con canonical source of truth. Uh, I was, when I was researching and learning about how to implement GraphQL, uh, one of the lessons that was stressed from experienced uh, users of it was that you should uh, spend a lot of time thinking carefully about your schema. Because what GraphQL actually ultimately allows you to do is uh, not worry about refactoring things later because it's, it's suitably decoupled. But what is not, what is at the center of all that is actually your GraphQL schema. So that's what you want to think carefully about uh, because you can pretty much change everything else around your application, how it works. As long as the schema is remaining the same, the clients that are using that uh, endpoint, that API, um, you know, you can swap out your backend, you can change all sorts of things, uh, but it'll still work, you won't break anything. Provides a quick, uh, sweet query interface, uh, and there's a cool tool that it also ships with, which is called Graphical, which is a, um, a query UI, which I'll, I'll demonstrate. So this is a little bit about the differences between uh, REST and um, GraphQL. So in a REST kind of setup, you'd have multiple endpoints, which then serve documents and get, get things from various backends in various ways. Whereas uh, with GraphQL, you have a single endpoint, um, which will then have types, document types, uh, which will then be connected to the backends. It could be connected to, you could aggregate your data from multiple backends in a single type if you wanted to. Um, but usually it would be like one backend. Uh, each type would be stored in one backend. Not that you have multiple backends necessarily. Like for our application, we mainly use um, MySQL as the backend, but we also get some stuff from uh, GitHub, 
and different sources. Uh, one important thing to understand about um, GraphQL is what it doesn't really do. It's, it doesn't care about your backend. All it is is uh, schemas, schema and resolvers, pretty much. Uh, There's a great video on YouTube called uh, Zero to GraphQL in 30 Minutes. This guy literally builds three GraphQL servers in 30 minutes. First one's in Ruby, second one in Python, and the third one in Node. It's an excellent video, uh, very quick to get a good understanding of how to do it. I'm going to today talk about implementing it in Node. Uh, so we're using uh, GraphQL and JavaScript. Well, actually, Jack. Uh, GraphQL and TypeScript. So the structure of a GraphQL server has schema and resolvers, that's pretty standard. And then it has data providers. It's not officially part of GraphQL providers, but it makes sense that that's the third part to me. And that's the actual uh, code that provides the data to the resolvers so it can uh, resolve the query. So for this, uh, Implementation. We're actually using this module GraphQL Server Express, which is by Apollo. Um, there's also a lot of other implementations. It's got a great ecosystem around it, and because it's by Facebook, it's very well supported and will continue to be so. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, there's also Express GraphQL. Oh, okay. So. Now we'll jump into some code. Demos here. I guess it's super tiny. So to get this set up, obviously you need to spin up a um, Express server. Let's go even bigger. Is it running? Yes. So this is uh, basically the server index, uh, including Express, Cores, a few other different uh, utilities. And then uh, this is the main action here, GraphQL routes. So that, that's pulled in from this GraphQL directory from my index. So this is pretty much all it takes to set up a, um, a GraphQL server. We need to get some uh, in, uh, packages, got some utilities there. And then I'm pulling in my resolvers from my resolver file. I'm pulling in my schema. This is um, my implementation is a little bit unusual. <clears throat> like um, most examples you see, they actually define the schema in JavaScript, but I wanted to define it directly in .graphql uh, file, so I get the, the, um, the nice uh, um, <coughs> code highlighting, syntax highlighting for that. Uh, and then you basically bake it into this schema object and attach it to your endpoint, and that's it really. <coughs> you can see here, got a standard express endpoint at the GraphQL path, and I'm uh, resolving that with GraphQL Express, which basically takes the schema, and uh, in this case, it's taking the root user. Uh, yeah, and then here I'm also spinning up um, another endpoint, which is Graphical. Now, Graphical, it's like a a tool that bundles with um, GraphQL. It's really, really cool, in my opinion. It's very uh, client uh, developer friendly. Um, I think one of the key benefits of GraphQL is that you can write a schema and then um, client developers can come along and they can use this tool to like uh, inspect, introspect your um, schema, understand what's available, write queries, test queries, and then um, once they've figured out what the query should be, they basically just paste them into the application. So here's a, here's a query here. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like. So I run the query, and this is what I get back. And you'll notice uh, the data that it returns is the same shape as the query itself. And that's really cool. Um, and then I can add new um, extra fields to that. And they start appearing there. If I don't ask for them, they don't appear. And then I can add uh, like uh, connected reference objects from there as well. So 
I have a permissions object which is uh, attached or referenced by the user object, so then I can get the permissions as well. And then I can get also like files. It's actually using the Metacraft schema. And then I get all my files. And then I can even do like crazy stuff. Like there I get my files with the extension. Then I can do really crazy stuff like go in here and let's get the user. Because I basically provides unlimited chaining here. So then I can get the user's full name again. And then I could even go in here and uh, get the files again. She wouldn't do, but the thing to understand is that you can kind of spider across your um, data schema from a single query, which is pretty powerful. Uh, back to the code. So that's graphical, uh, very useful tool. Uh, so now I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the schema and resolvers. So this is a GraphQL schema. Basically, it's like defining types. I have a type called user, which has an ID, which is an integer. It has an uh, auth zero ID, which is also which is an ID, scalar type. Uh, full name, uh, email, files, which turn, returns an array of file type, which is defined down here. Uh, then I have uh, user permissions object, which I was querying before. We have a bunch more stuff. I actually took this project and stripped it down for the sake of this talk, because it's too much code otherwise. So you define your types, and then you define your queries, which basically tells you uh, uh, <coughs> what you can query, and you have to also provide a resolver to actually resolve those queries. So this is a user query. It accepts a username, and it returns a user object, which then you can get any fields from that user object that you want, just request them. We've got a files query, and then you've got another class of queries, which is called a mutation. So a mutation is to deal with um, actions like create, update, or delete. So you're actually mutating your data. So you can find them in similar ways. They take arguments here, and then they return something, a user permission. In this case, a revoke user permission which returns a boolean, whether it worked or didn't work. And then finally, you bundle all those into your schema, and that's it. And one cool thing about doing it this way, it's like not the most common way to actually use .graphql, but it means I can use this utility here. Stop that. So I uh, stored this package globally. It's uh, uh, graphql2 TypeScript which is using this utility called GraphQL to TypeScript, which when I run that, it um, takes this uh, GraphQL schema and actually makes it a, a TypeScript document, which is fairly useful. So I have a user object and so forth, a user type, a user interfaces for all these guys, which means that uh, I can then use those in my resolvers to make sure I'm not breaking something. Those who have used TypeScript um, know that it's quite useful for eliminating a certain class of bugs, and it gives you kind of uh, increased intelligence power. So this is uh, the resolvers file. This is the other main, main part of a GraphQL uh, setup. So what the idea with the resolver is that you define a query, and you're basically just finding the shape of the query, what's available, what it should return. But then you actually need to have some code which will resolve that query. So I've put them all in one file here. I've got this big resolver object with query, mutation. Uh, these are special. I'll explain those in a sec. And then basically, I'm, uh, <coughs> this is what's resolving. This stuff here actually is my authentication, which I'm going to talk about a bit later. But pretty much, if I was to um, strip it back without the authentication, that's all it is. So I'm passing the argument into the fetch user, which is my provider thing that I created. So, um, yeah, mutation, you also provide a resolver, 
And here, like if we look in the schema again, this user has some fields here, like this one files, it returns an array of files. So uh, that's not directly from the database, that's actually another query that runs. So that requires a resolver. So you just find them here, my files property should be resolved by my files fetched by user, which then takes the, uh, the root user, it just passes down the line. So the same with permissions, files, and in some cases you might want to like do some special handling, like say you're, you return some data from the database and it's, um, it needs some transformation or something. So you can just, for any of those uh, properties, you can write your own resolver. In this case, it just um, checks that it's uh, not null. Yeah. So that's it. That's, uh, that's resolvers, which combines with the schema to provide your thing. And then you need to obviously have data provider. So I, I've created a, in here you can see um, resolver, schema types, that's the TypeScript, GraphQL schema, the index. And here we have my provider, which has, um, I have a provider for my users, fetch users, fetch user, just various methods, which the resolvers call. And one for the files. And then I'm actually providing this data from MySQL, so I have another layer abstraction here, which is just a, just a wrapper around nodes uh, MySQL package, which basically just provides really low-level CRUD helpers, select, insert, update, delete, and run query. Yeah, so let's look at a mutation. So here I'm going to run this uh, mutation. Oh, I have to fetch. Like demo time, down. huh? This is it? I turn, oh, that's right. I turned it off to run that uh, utility. Right. So I'm inserting a permission here. You can see the argument uh, server restart. I can actually, like, if you want to make it a bit more clear, you can tab this down and accept that. Also has a, this thing, Prettify, I'm not going to push it, but if you push that, it, it formats all your queries. So if you write them really ugly, you can just like follow up with that. I'm not going to push it now because it will actually delete all my other commented out stuff. So I can, yeah, you can see in the database, tiny, tiny little, well, yeah, that's not going to expand much. Uh, oh, perhaps. Don't have any uh, duplicate handling on that particular query. So yeah, if I uh, if I change permission to server, uh, I don't know, boot, insert it. You can see that that got inserted into the database. Okay, uh, not sure what else I can say about that. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about authentication because. This is a very basic example without authentication, but uh, usually you want to authenticate like what data the user can or cannot access. Uh, we have two tiers of users in MagicCraft at the moment, uh, admins who can access everything pretty much, and non-admins who can only access data pertaining to their own user identity. So GraphQL doesn't provide anything for that out of the box. The way I have done it is, um, I've got this authorization file, which um, adds authorization to the actual endpoint, which is serving the GraphQL. So in this particular case, we've used um, Express JWT, JSON Web Token, which is basically a giant token which you can pack or unpack, and contains um, data inside it after you unpack it with the secret. So we actually use um, Auth0, for authentication, we put the user on a uh, uh, hosted login page. It's actually hosted by Auth0. They do their login. Uh, we use GitHub to login. And then it sends them back with a uh, JWT in the 
in the hash of the URL. We put that into local storage, and then we attach it to every query that we um, send to the uh, API. So that comes in. The, uh, this, this middleware here, this Express JWT, JWT middleware, will unpack the token. Uh, well, first it verifies it, if it's a valid token, if it actually does unpack with the secret. And if it does unpack, then it, um, it passes it on to the next uh, middleware. If it doesn't, then it just returns a, a 401 access denied. And then you usually you define a couple of um, uh, handlers, which then pick it up from there. So this particular handler, if it runs, if it's actually validated, and it takes, it unpacks the token, takes the user ID out of the token, and then does a full user load, and then passes, attaches that user here, you can see, to the request, uh, attaches the user, and then goes to the next. So that means, if we go back to this uh, GraphQL index, at this point, uh, where we're serving the GraphQL, we actually have the user on the request as the root value. You could also pass it in as a context. Uh, I'd pass it in as a root value. So that means that here, each of these uh, resolvers has the current user, which means that I can do, I've got some help, authorization helpers, so it takes the current user and figures it out if they're, the argument that's been passed, is it the current user, or is the current user admin? If, if they're admin, they'll pass it through. So it is self or admin, or is it admin or self? And that's the way, an easy way to do authentication. If I, I, this isn't actually turned on in this demo, because if I did, then I couldn't use that GraphQL endpoint. Uh, that graphical endpoint, because the graphical doesn't, it's just basically a giant blob of static HTML, so you can't actually attach a token to it very easily. But there is a, um, a React component uh, for graphical, which does allow you to, I'll show you what that looks like. Here, um, so basically, you just render it like a normal component. But what it does is allow you to pass in a, like a configuration object. So we do that, and then attach our uh, here in this line. We actually attach the JWT, take it out of local storage, attach it to the uh, query, and then send it. Which means that in your app, in your client, in any client especially with a React client, you can just place this on a page, and then the client developers can use that to just figure out what they can query. Another cool thing about uh, Graphical here is you get a full like, um, documentation of the API for free out of the box. So I can click down on this and it tells me what queries are available. I can drill right down. It returns a user so I can see what the user consists of. and. Then see what mutations are available. Another type of query is actually a subscription. I didn't put that in because it's like I found that I set up uh, GraphQL queries and mutations and so forth, the server, and that was OK. Bit of work, a couple of days to, to get my head fully around it. And then I went to set up subscriptions a bit later, and that was about the same work again, just to put that in. Uh, it's a little bit. Uh, yeah, we're using Apollo to do subscriptions. It's a very cool feature because basically it means that you can have an app that's sitting there, it fetches its data to start with to get its state, and then let's say you push in from another browser tab or another application or whatever, new data into the uh, database, then that will automatically get pushed down to the um, subscribed clients. So yeah, pretty nice. Yeah, so other than that, um, it's pretty much an overview. Just again, Josh is heading to NDC Oslo. That's why he's dressed as like a Sith Lord tonight. It's his costume. He's trial running his costume for NDC Oslo. It's a big, big thing for us. We're going to uh, launch Magicraft in Europe. And then also um, Code Dojo Coolest Projects in Ireland. And actually, that's our strategy now. Microsoft recently released their... Uh, Coding in Minecraft app, which is fairly similar to what we're doing. Of course, they're Microsoft. Oh, copy yeah, they copied us. Um, but we're going to be more fun and more open. We're pretty much going fully open source. 
uh, allowing every code, every piece of code that somebody writes, we can push it to GitHub. So it's going to be discoverability on GitHub. And now we're actually writing MagicCraft inside MagicCraft, it's like MagicCraft Inception. We have this tab here, APIs. A lot of dummy crap in that room. Um, so you can see we've got our spells API, which is the actual API that allows kids to discover spells in Minecraft and cast them. That's like our proprietary API. And then we have the MCT one. I'm, I'm, I don't actually haven't been working on it at all, but um, that contains all the code for the plugin that Prahlad was talking about, which simulates mind, uh, type 1 diabetes in Minecraft. Basically, you eat food, and that will increase your blood glucose level, and then you have to drink uh, potions in Minecraft, uh, which simulate insulin, which then, and you get the status bars on the screen, which is basically your blood glucose, your insulin, and then you have to balance and make sure you're in the right range. Otherwise, when you eat food, you'll get like various negative effects. We use like potion effects, poison effects, and different things to like make the player dizzy or take, may take damage and so forth. The cool thing is that uh, plugin is now written inside MagicCraft, the MagicCraft IDE. It can be available on GitHub, so then like another developer can uh, just pull that, pull that into the editor, start playing around with it, run it in a MagicCraft server. And yeah, we want to create a, a big open source community, people writing mini games and cool little plugins in Minecraft using MagicCraft. Um, currently, I don't know if anybody's written any Minecraft plugins, but it's a bit of like infrastructure setup. You've basically got to have a Java pipeline, compile, you write your plugin, compile your plugin, and then like uh, put it inside your server. And then like if you wanted to run codes, you'd have to also FTP your codes into the server, so that's going to stop like 99% of people actually experimenting with it, whereas we allow you to write Minecraft plugins in JavaScript, in a browser, push save, go to Minecraft, run it, you get, a, you get an error message or it'll work. So it really, really makes it easy, and we're really excited to see what people uh, will create using it. Cool, uh, any questions? Thanks a lot.